I'm recording. Thank you. Okay. And welcome to the very first remote uh, Women in Agile London. Um, just want to thank Judy so much for being so adaptable and flexible and, and agile uh, to how we were doing this tonight. Um, okay, so now I will share my screen. We just have a few things we like to go through at the start of our meetup. Some of you may be new to Women in Agile. So, um, we are a not-for-profit global organization. This is the London chapter you've joined tonight, but we exist to promote and amplify the voices of women within the agile community and beyond. But it's not women only uh, meetup, men, allies, everybody is welcome so we can work together towards this goal. And this is our code of conduct for um, our attendees and members. Just give you a chance just to read that through. But basically, just just be nice. <laughs> uh, we want to always keep this a very safe and supportive uh, space. That's what we're striving to do always. Everyone read? Fast readers, yeah? Cool, okay. Um, where we normally thank our photography crew. Uh, don't have films tonight, but they will be editing for us because uh, this will go out on, on YouTube to our channel. If you want to catch up with any of our past events, you can do so on our Meetup channel. Just search Women in Agile London on YouTube and you will find our stuff. Um, also want to promote uh, an amazing event happening in June in Germany. It is the second ever Women in Agile open space event. And um, you can read here what they're, they're, they're really trying to do. They're just trying to create an amazing space for people to live wholeheartedly and co-create um, uh, kinder communities for all. Uh, I think Deb is on the call. You want to say a word, Deb? Hello. Hello. We're, we're really excited about Whole Heart. Um, the, the, the theme has really come together and that the, the idea is that each of us needs to contribute to make our community have a whole heart, to make our workplaces have a whole heart and to contribute wholeheartedly. So if you're curious about that, um, get on our mailing list, we'll tell you more, we'd love to talk to you. Can I ask where Rukas Bach is? I'm German, but I've never heard of it. Um, half an hour from Frankfurt airport, roughly. Okay, cool. <laughs> There you go, connections already. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for just letting me call you on the spot there, Deb. We did not discuss that, thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, so we, oh, we have a shiny new work in progress website for our group because we realized we had so much going on on social media um, that things were getting lost. So womeninagile.london best. Uh, I really love that we managed to get that domain space. So thanks to Andre for that. Um, we've got our Twitter, our, you're already members of the meetup group, and again, you can join our, mm. um, our channel. If you'd like to get involved with the Global Org, what we like to refer to as the mothership, here are the all ways right. that you can do so. Um, you, there is a Slack group for all members of Women in right. Agile Globally, and they also have a, which is starting up, I think, now the mentor new voices for some of the big conferences. So for Agile 2020, I think they're currently looking for people to mentor or to be mentored um, if they'd like to try something mm. out. Um, cool. So that's all the things we had to do to start. So it is show time. Um, um, I'd, like to, <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce Judy. As I met Judy about four or five years ago when I was taking her class, which was a uh, clean language for Agile coaches which just unlocked a whole new skill for me and made me look differently at the way that I um, interact and talk with the people that I work with. Um, she's also currently the busiest woman on the planet, uh, given that she's a specialist in remote working. Everything that's going on just means that she is very, very busy. So we're very lucky to have her tonight. So I'd like to hand over to you now, Judy. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's really brilliant to be here i'm very very excited i was excited about doing it in in the room with everybody but actually it's even more exciting to do it remotely because i, I love doing remote facilitation it's one of my favorite things and uh, i get to show you what i like about it which is always a great joy 
So tonight's conversation is about difficult remote conversations. Um, and in order to get us started, I'd like you to be making this content your own. So I'm going to invite you in a moment to, to go, again go into breakout groups. If not everybody had a go, I don't think. There are a few people who've just arrived. You'll be in a breakout group with uh, one or two other people. And my invitation to you is to talk about this question. What's one difficult kind of remote conversation that you have regularly or you th fear you will have that you'd like to be different? What's one kind of remote conversation that you would like to be different? And of course, you don't have to agree it. If there are three of you in the room, you could have three different ones, but just get your, your cogs whirring about that topic. If the breakout rooms don't work for you, or if you find yourself on your own in a breakout room after a few 30 seconds or so, just come back here. It's very straightforward. Otherwise, you'll have about three minutes to talk about this before I press the button to bring you back. And that starts a 60 second countdown in which you can close off your conversations before coming back to the room. Make sense? If you haven't done this before, hold on to your hats. Yes, so I guess one, one thing we discussed that could be quite challenging is one-to-ones. And when you're discussing things like pay rises or performance issues, that's probably quite challenging. If you've met the person, easier. If you haven't, then obviously that's more challenging. Mm -hmm. So one-to-ones, pay rises, that kind of thing. Who's got something different? Shout out, please. I used to do a lot of first round interviewing. Um, would offer when, when I was hiring job candidates in my old job, we'd offer them, do you want to come and meet for coffee? But when people are remote or they're in other countries, um, and, and one of the big challenges there was just trying to get through to people that you're, you're kind of in a parking lot on your lunch break, trying to use your phone to make a Skype call and you're very unlikely to get hired on the basis of this experience <laughs> in a way that kind of, it, it didn't, this is the, the difficult thing. It didn't reflect in any way on their aptitude for the role or anything. It's just like, you know, I'm not going to go through and allocate two hours to get into a room with you based on my experience of this conversation because of technology and constraints and people not understanding properly. Um, I had one, one person once, so I said, can you switch your camera on? And he went, oh, yeah, hang on, I'll just go and put on a shirt. I was like, it's a job interview, you know. <laughs> um, and I think that's that. I think that people, you know, some people just don't treat it seriously. They've never done it before and they think it's a bit of fun. And then they're like, oh, why didn't I get the job? And it's like, you didn't wear a shirt to the interview. Any questions? Yes, wear a shirt to the interview. That's a, that's a good piece of advice, isn't it? You, you'd think they'd know that by now, but you know. Who's got something different, a different kind of uh, remote meeting that they'd like to be different? Um, when you're presenting to a group and there's lots of different um, kind of ideas and a lot of sort of tension in the room what about how you manage that yeah, lots of different tension in the room that's fun isn't it <laughs> yeah what kind of tension just disagreements in terms of uh, if one group want a certain thing and another group wants another a thing that, that differ and about how you get the opportunity to have that debate in a structured manner Mm. Oh, interesting stuff. Thank you. And is there one more, one more person that would like to share their thing they'd like to be different, their kind of meeting they'd like to be different? I find that they can be really difficult when they're remote because you just don't get that sense of coming together to brainstorm. Mm. So remote retrospectives, yeah, coming together to brainstorm. Um, there are lots of great uh, online retrospective tools that might help but it's still something that's worth paying attention to. I know a lot of you always love PowerPoint, so I have got some PowerPoint slides, but I'm not going to do the share screen thing. Um, if you are interested in slides, I've just shared a Google Slides link in the chat. Um, feel free to follow along if slides are your kind of thing. Um, and I'm going to show one slide, if I can do it like this, which is to share this quote successful 
remote working results from a finely tuned, consciously chosen combination of skill set, mindset and tool set. This, is, this quote is from Lizette Sutherland, my friend and colleague, who wrote the fantastic book, Work Together Anywhere. And I thought it provides a nice place to start this conversation about difficult remote conversations. Because tackling difficult remote conversations like a pro involves a conversation, a, a, combi a, a combination of skill set, mindset, and tool set. So we'll be talking at least briefly about skill set, mindset, and tool set this evening. Um, this trick, by the way, is using virtual backgrounds in Zoom. Zoom is not the perfect tool, and I'm not getting money from Zoom for, for recommending them, but it is by far the best online video conferencing tool for an event like this, not least, least because of the breakout rooms. <laughs> um, so, skill set, mindset, tool set. First up, I want to look at skill set. Skill set is really the area where I do most of my work. I spend a lot of time teaching people to do their work effectively when they're remote. It's about um, learning how to do this thing because we're not born knowing it. I think it's quite interesting teaching remote working skills and remote meeting skills because nobody comes out of the womb knowing how to do video conferencing and nobody expects anyone to. So unlike so many other things, you'd think that people would be okay with learning. But there's a thing about learning, an awful lot of people find it uncomfortable. <laughs> that they find it challenging, that they don't want to go through the process of, um, you know, trying things, experimenting, and finding that some things work better than other things, or some things work, work less well than other things. But as I, Agilists, you've already been through that uh, discussion, so you already know that we're, we're not going to get better at things without experimenting with things that are uncomfortable. When it comes to skill sets, an awful lot of the skills you have as an in-the-room facilitator, and a lot of you are facilitators, I know, whether, whether you're an agile, you call yourself an agile coach or a scrum master or, or product owner, whatever it is, a lot of what you do will be group facilitation. And a lot of those skills are transferable to remote. But there are some things that are definitely different. We'll mention a few of them tonight, but the one I want to pay most attention to is attention. A lot of people don't realize that attention is a skill. It's something that can be trained and developed. Of course, people have natural abilities one way or another, but as with so many things, you can get an awful lot better very, very quickly when you pay attention. And attention is subtly different when we're remote from when we're in the room. The number of things that are available to pay attention to, the number of different modalities, we lose some things that we would normally pay attention to, like physical movement in relation to each other. And we gain some new channels, like trying to pay attention to the chat at the same time as trying to pay attention to 40 odd video streams. There's a lot going on. But feedback matters a lot when you're remote, particularly when you're having difficult conversations, because it provides critical real-time feedback. If you're not paying attention, you're not going to get an indication of whether people are participating or not. So attention matters. And knowing how and where to pay attention underpins the development of all the other remote facilitation, remote conversation skills. Because without attention, you won't notice what happens when you do your various experiments. So attention really matters. And what I'm going to invite you to do in a moment 
is an activity around attention. Um, just let me get myself organized. Um, in the moment, you're going to be in breakout rooms and you're going to take it in turns to be the speaker and the listener. Most of you will be in twos. If you're in a three, you might need to move, move around quite quickly. You're going to take turns to be the speaker and the listener. The speaker's job is to talk about something important to you. That could be something at work, it could be a hobby, it could be a partner, anything like that. Talk about something important to you. The listener's job is to go through three states. First, you're going to listen fully and pay attention to the speaker. Then after a few seconds, you're going to be distracted. You can pick up your phone, you can pick up your um, iPad, you can go off and do your emails, you can even go and read a book just for a few seconds and then come back and return to listening. You need to be visibly distracted and then return to listening. And then when you've done the three states, swap roles and do it the other way around. You're going to have a total of four minutes, including the one minute countdown. So please time yourself quite tightly. I'm gonna mix up the rooms. I'm going to hope that this ends up with mostly twos and a couple of threes. If you find yourself on your own in a room or if the room um, you're in um, seems to be empty, then please just come back here and we'll do something in this space. Your machine. Uh, it's the name on the machine. Sorry, it's Liz. <laughs> Liz, you, you can rename yourself if you want to. If you hover your cursor over your own picture, there are three dots appear at the top right. And one of the options is rename, if that's something uh -huh. you like to do. Okay, we're almost all back. There we go. I think that's everybody back. I'm curious, how was that? What did you discover? What happened when your listener was distracted? Oh. <laughs> I think, I think at some point it was for you too difficult to focus on what you want to say next. So mm -hmm. it's like prevents you to, uh, you, are, you are like asking yourself, oh, what's going on? Am I, am someone listening to me? Or, or what I want to say next? You're sort of like getting distracted as well. Mm, so it's really difficult to stay focused on what you were going to say next. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, did anyone have a similar or a different experience? I could not help laughing. Charlotte, Sorry. go ahead. I could not help laughing. I was guessing when it's, when it's only between the two of you, you can't help but react to it. <laughs> if you're in a group, you will probably try to ignore it and you're more likely to ignore it. Yes, interesting, isn't it? And Isabel? I was just going to say, I, I, I was wondering whether I should stop and wait. Yeah, so you just sort of dry up and you want to stop talking, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what most people find with this activity. A few people do have the ability to keep talking when their listener is distracted. Did anyone have that experience? I was able to keep talking, but I recognized that I slowed down the pace a little bit and stuttered mm -hmm. a little bit and did a bit of mm, uh, mm, mm. but I managed to keep going. So you managed to keep going, but it, it did it clearly had an effect. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, yeah, um, and for me, um, I, I did notice that they weren't listening and I kind of just looked away and continued what I was saying. So I I took my eyes off the screen for a bit and and then, then I looked back after a while. <laughs> Interesting. You don't have a background in, in education, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's testing a theory that the people who can keep talking when their listeners are all distracted have all got backgrounds in primary education. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't found it to be completely consistent yet. Um, so you had the experience. You noticed that when your listener is distracted, 
it has an effect on the speaker. Is there a relationship between that and remote conversations? Danielle, what, 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 what's the relationship for you? Um, I, 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 I think it comes back to absolutely what you said about attention, that attention and trust, because sometimes then we, we can struggle if we're uh, struggling, feel like we're struggling to read the feedback that we're getting visually, and we may start to create narratives in our head that aren't even true, but that might be quite negative around what's happening with the other person and start to think it's something we've done. And before we know it, communication can get more complicated than it needs to be because mm. we're sort of both in our heads, not, not struggling to read cues. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, somebody else was speaking? Did someone else start to speak and I talked over them? I thought I heard someone speak. Yeah, so... Um, yeah it, is there any other relationship between all of that and remote meetings is it possible that you can elaborate that question a bit because i'm not sure what you're asking hmm. so I'm, I'm just curious whether hmm i suppose rather than ask the question then i'll just say what i think <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, so what I think is that uh, there is a close relationship between attention and an awful lot of remote conversations because an awful lot of people don't um, pay attention on remote calls. They don't turn their video camera on, not because they've got a dodgy background with laundry in it. They've got... <laughs> They don't turn their video camera on because they're not actually intending to pay any attention to the call. Mm. And what they're actually going to do is their email or whatever else they were going to do. And the thing about that is that the quality of your attention determines the quality of another person's thought. It's one of my favorite quotes from Nancy Klein. The quality of your attention can determine the quality of another person's thought. So, so many people are showing up to remote conversations, not intending to pay any attention. They haven't developed the skill of paying attention on remote calls. They don't pay attention. And then the quality of everybody else's thinking crashes through the floor. The people who are good at difficult remote conversations of all kinds have developed the skill of paying attention. They've developed the skill of noticing what's going on. Mm. Comments, questions, observations before I go on. I, I think that's definitely true when um you know, people book meetings in your diary, um, you think, oh, great, Skype, I can, you know, I can do my emails and do several things at the same time and talk to them, but you, you don't pay attention to the whole problem that they're, they're discussing. And I think that's true of a lot of people. Yeah, I do. But I think sometimes it's warranted. <laughs> 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 because people book meetings with no agenda they don't know why they are super long and um, <clears throat> I see same patterns face to face maybe it's just less blatant but it, it's fairly similar mm -hmm. um, and the, I think it's a survival technique if you just had to pay attention to all those nonsense meeting well I'm not sure you could do <laughs> <anything>. <laughs> Yeah, so, so where's the problem here? Is it actually with the organiser of the meeting who invites all sorts of random people? And of course, remote meetings are worse than in the room meetings. It's not your imagination. They are worse. And there are reasons that that's the case. One is that um, it's terribly easy to say yes to a remote meeting because you assume you're going to be able to do other things during it. 
you're not going to have to book travel time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't even need to book a meeting room. And in any large organization, the number of possible meetings is absolutely enormous. And when we were limited by the number of meeting rooms, there was a limit on the number of meetings. Now, because remote meetings are effectively limitless in most organizations, there are more and more meetings. And when there are more and more meetings, there's less and less preparation, there's less and less thought, there's less and less attention. And you end up with this massively um, depressing double doom loop about remote meetings. People expect them to be bad, they don't prepare, they turn up intending to multitask, and then by an astonish astonishing coincidence, the meeting is bad. So it's not your imagination. Remote meetings are worse. But they can be absolutely awesome. They can be better. Um, one of the things that uh, I love doing is organizing unconferences, open space um, events using Zoom and similar platforms. And you can get a bunch of people online together. I've done it for a, a whole 12 hour day so that we could um, have people from Australia and the West Coast of America. And the first time I ran it, I thought, oh, people will drop in for two hours, whatever's convenient for them. But I was astonished when people just stayed online for the whole time. Children went unfed, dogs went unwalked, and people just stayed. They wanted to be part of the conversation. In another event, uh, in a different series, it was a four hour block, European afternoon time. And um, one of the guys, who joined just to say hello at the beginning was someone who was doing the digital nomad thing in uh, Australia. He was in the Australian outback in a camper van. He got drawn into the conversation and stayed online. And he only dropped off the call at about three o'clock in the morning his time when his last battery ran out of juice. So these things can be interesting, they can be compelling but there's stuff that needs to happen to make it so. I'm a bit on my hobby horse here, so I'm pausing in case there are comments, questions, observations. I think I found myself using tools like the Lightning Decision Jam or other things where I almost force people to communicate. So when doing retros and because they're online, we use a mirror board, but within that, everybody has to contribute. And I think that's basically I took this as in forcing people to, to help or to, to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> but now when you're mentioning, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, forcing or inviting very forcefully or <laughs> 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 telling people they've got to. Yeah, um, assigning roles and getting people saying, you know, everybody must participate is a, a, it has to happen really, doesn't it sometimes? Somebody else started speaking, was it Stacy? Yeah, I just wanted to share something interesting. When Nuha and I were together doing that experiment, the last breakout session, we both recognized that when we were deliberately not paying attention, we felt very rude. We felt like we were, we were being disrespectful and rude. And I think there's something in that mindset. And if I'm going to assume then that we aren't the only ones that felt that way. So there is something that could work in our favor, I think, if we can tap into that in the collective wanting to have a successful meeting and wanting to be productive and wanting to engage. And, yeah, mm, yeah, I think if, if we can appeal to people's better nature and they appreciate that lack of attention is rudeness rather than just how it is, there is something high value there. Oh, I've got to share my favorite way of persuading people to use their video camera to do this. Hello and welcome to the meeting. Let's get started. Who, who, who have we got on the call? Um, that'll be Stacy. Excellent. Hello, Stacy. Nice to, nice to hear you. And off I go like that. And eventually they get the message. <laughs> <laughs> There's one interesting point about attention that I don't think anyone's picked up on this yet, which is eye contact. Because yeah. this is, is, is something like 
right now i can't see any of you because i'm looking into my webcam which is over here and so from your perspective hopefully it looks like i'm talking to you but i can't see your faces because i'm looking at this little black slab with logitech written on the side of it and eye contact is such a fundamental way of maintaining a connection with people whether you're on a one-on-one -on -one conversation or you're you know speaking to an audience or trying to make a point in a meeting and we just haven't solved it at all for remote technology yet everybody is always talking to the other person's forehead or their chin or the side of their face like this because that's where the screen is um and that's that's something that i you know really struggle with i don't even think it's something you can you can learn to work around it's just a perpetual frustration of mm. any kind of remote remote video solution. Um, I'm interested if anyone has any contrasting experiences with it. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right that it is something that technology has not solved, is not likely to solve in short order, and um, we have to work around it. Um, my experience is that people can get used to working around it. Um, it may not ever be as comfortable if you're the kind of person who loves a lot of eye contact, then it will be uncomfortable for you to lose that. However, there's a whole bunch of people in our um, world for whom the loss of eye contact online is a huge relief. Um, I happen to be one of them, um, but there are people for whom direct eye contact is super uncomfortable as well as lots of people for whom it's a great joy. Hmm. So it, it's, it's an interesting you win some, lose some situation. Now I'm gonna press on a little bit um, so that we get to the end of what we intended to cover in this block. Um, I just wanted to mention um, influence and attention in passing. One of the most interesting uses of attention is in influencing people. Um, if you glance at the slides, there's um, a slide there about the collaborative influence cycle, which starts by paying attention. When people really want to influence some, somebody else, the first thing they do is notice what's going on for that other person. Then maybe ask some questions to find out more about that. They guide attention to find out more. And only once they know what's happening for the other person, do they do their speaking up? Do they make their pitch? Whatever it is. You, you don't go into the dragon's den without having looked up who the dragons are and the kinds of things that they're looking for. So attention can make a difference there. And as I mentioned before, attention is an important underpinning skill of a whole bunch of other skills that can be developed in relation to uh, remote conversations. Um, when people do my, uh, my trainings, we look at things like, what are the mechanisms for keeping your group engaged? How can you make sure everybody's participating? What are some of the things that you need to do in designing the meeting to maximize engagement? Another one is, how do you track the energy of the group? You can't smell them. I did some research uh, to find out how did great in the room facilitators track the energy. One guy said, I smell it. <laughs> um, you can't do that online. So how do you track the energy? Another one that is complicated is how do we use the online space? We can't do things like the ball game where, where we actually physically pass things to each other. So what can we do instead? How can we use this little box that we find ourselves in to maximize the value for the conversation? A particular challenge in relation to difficult conversations is in most video calls, the setup is that you are face to face with the other person. Whereas if you are having a difficult conversation with somebody in, in the flesh, you'd probably sit down next to them so as not to appear to be confrontational. So there's a bunch of stuff you can do around that, which is bigger than this call, but it just highlights some of the skills. Another one, which a few people on the call will be well aware of and relates to that um, discussion where there's a lot of tension, a lot of difference within the group. How do you manage the point of greatest difference the groan zone, as it gets called. 
which is going to be really, really uncomfortable. Now, in the room, people will mostly, not universally, but they'll mostly stay in the room because there's huge social pressure to, to stay with the conversation. When you're online, suddenly the machine knows that it's really uncomfortable and your internet fails. <laughs> <laughs> um, people will literally disconnect as they go through that discomfort. So managing that remotely is a skill to develop. Uh, some of you will have seen my, my favorite slide, which is the um, capabilities of creative collaborative teams as uh, told in the book Collective Genius by Professor Linda Hill and her team. She talks about how creative teams need creative agility to come up with new ideas, um, creative resolution to decide which one to follow, but they also need creative abrasion, the ability to argue and discuss and have differences of opinion in order to thrash things out in a creative way. It's important to be able to manage that tension. And when people get good at this stuff, that's something they know how to do. I feel like I've been talking too long and need to put you into breakout rooms again. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a bell that goes off in my head. So I am going to invite you back again into breakout rooms of about two or three people. Um, the conversation at this point is having heard what you've heard so far, what are you curious about now? We won't necessarily get to answer all your questions, but a bit later on there will be Q&A time. So what are you curious about? Again, you're going to have a total of three, four minutes, including the countdown time, to talk about that in your small group. I want to just quickly share my screen and show you just a couple of these slides, because uh, I think um, some of these quotes bear um, mentioning. Does anybody know who these three young women are? Oh. Mm. They're, they're the Polgar nope. sisters, the three um, chess grandmasters, the first women oh. chess grandmasters. And I only found this out the other day that Laszlo Polgar, their father, actually had his daughters as an experiment. He was an educational psychologist and he was completely convinced of the importance of nurture over nature. And he decided to marry someone who was willing to be part of a big experiment with him. Oh. He wasn't even big on chess. He just chose chess as being the thing to teach his daughters because people couldn't then claim it was artistic merit or something. You either win a game of chess or you don't. So um, when it comes to the mindset of um, re remote conversations and getting good at it, I think there's something to be learned from Laszlo Polgar. He took the view that anyone can pretty much learn anything. It's about practice. It's about figuring out how you can practice. Now, when it comes to difficult conversations, that's an interesting one. Um, anyone know this, this girl, Sky Brown? She's going to be the youngest um, British female in the Olympics, assuming the Olympics go ahead. 11 years old, absolutely awesome um, skateboarder and surfer. Um, anyway, the sports psychologist, and as Ericsson says, you have to work at what you can't do. So the difficult conversations are the ones to pay attention to. But of course, there is a challenge when it comes to difficult conversations. It feels really uncomfortable to practice them because by their nature, they're difficult. So you might want to choose to find a different place um, to practice rather than your own most difficult conversations. For example, you could ask someone else if they'd like you to facilitate their conversation. Swap facilitators for retros, that kind of thing, and see if you can build your skills in that way. I'm not gonna labor the point about mindset because of course the biggest shift in terms of mindset um, is to respond to change, experiments, um, 
constantly improve stuff that you guys already know from your agile skill mind your agile mindset we don't need to go much beyond that um and i want to press on to tool set because some people will be itching to talk tools a lot of people start with tools when it comes to remote conversations and of course tools are important we if we didn't have the technological tools we wouldn't be able to have the conversations in the first place so they are important but they're not the most important thing and they're not the only important thing great remote conversations arise from a converse, a, a combination of infrastructure the technolo technological things and the facilitator skill, the ability to actually manage a conversation. Now, when I was putting this um, talk together, I thought I was just going, at this point, I was just going to be showing a picture of an Edwardian lady cyclist wearing a long frock and um, show, demonstrating that, of course, you need the right tools for the job. But I was searching for such a picture and I came across somebody absolutely amazing. And I want to share this picture. This young lady is Tessie Reynolds, a 16 year old from Brighton, who in 1893 set the very first women's record for cycling from London to Brighton and Brighton to London. Her time was just over eight hours at the same time the men's record was only just under seven hours. Hmm? Tessie Reynolds was amazing in a bunch of ways. As you can see from the uh, picture, she doesn't wear skin tight lycra. She didn't wait for people to invent the carbon framed bicycle. She didn't even wait for anyone to invent the helmet. She cracked on and used what she had. But you can also notice something interesting about Tessie. She's not wearing one of those long skirts. She's adopted rational dress. She's basically said, I'm not having it. A skirt catches in the chain, it catches the wind, it slows me down and it's dangerous. I'm not having it. And she was hugely controversial at the time. She was written up in all the papers, but mostly approvingly that she was clearly demure, but she had adopted rational dress. So she was actually a really awesome pioneer of the women's movement. Um, and I'd never heard of her until I started putting together this, uh, this talk. But where I'm going with that is that we shouldn't be waiting for virtual reality or um, magic uh, connecting boards and these kind of things in order to have the conversations we need to have. We don't need to wait for the technology to catch up. The technology is good enough as long as a few things are in place. The basics are that everybody on your call should be heard and seen. That um, sounds straightforward, but I'm astonished by how many organizations have horrible hybrid meetings, some people in the room together, and then some or a small number or one out on a limb, connected only via a nasty spider phone in the middle of the table. The remote people can't hear, they can't see, they can't be heard and they can't be seen. That is not the place to have a difficult remote conversation. Everybody heard, everybody seen. And when it comes to everybody heard, everybody seen, you might want to consider these points, both for yourself and for your conversational partners. You should have decent bandwidth. We can't do this without an internet connection. You need high quality audio. That usually means a headset. Turn your camera on get them to turn their camera on. The amount of information flowing through the video stream is enormous. Whether it's um, holding up little uh, cards to the camera, you're on mute, all that kind of thing. 
um, or simply seeing people's facial expressions. It matters. Once the camera's on, get some lighting. Get it so people can actually see your face. And then you might consider, th I mean, it's less important, but it's still important. Things like your background, let's try not to have too much laundry um, and background noise. Where possible, let's not have you uh, alongside somebody making a noisy phone call about their next job. So those are the basics. That's the equivalent of rational dress. Um, and I do invite you to pay attention to those things. So um, one more quick slide share. I'm trying not to do too many. Question. Yes, do. So if you have, let's say, eight people that are in the office and a few are remote, would you then still have these eight people in a room and the ones who are remote being able to see them? Or would you then say everybody needs to, to be at their desk? If possible, everybody should be at their best, at their desks, or everybody should be on a separate device. One person, one device, one quiet place makes a huge difference to the quality of the call and much, much easier to facilitate. However, I acknowledge that's not always possible. If you are stuck with the hybrid format, use decent kit. Okay. So that means there are tools like the meeting owl, which is a thing that looks a bit like an owl that sits in the middle of a, a desk. Um, it's got a camera on it. It's a 360 degree microphone. The camera takes a picture of the whole um, meeting as well as focusing on the person who's speaking. And you can use that in conjunction with all the remote people have their pictures on a screen so that everybody can be seen. Okay, thank you. So everybody heard, everybody seen can be done it's not as good as everybody remote but it works so i was just going to um i'm hoping you can see my screen there are just a few things that if you want to learn more um here are some links this this is the page to sort of uh, take a note of um webinars that connect is a how-to guide for running live online events like this one educational events. If you want the, the recipe for what I've been doing tonight, Webinars That Connect, which is a free ebook written by myself and Steve McCann. It's one of those, uh, put your email address and, and download the book. You can always um, unsubscribe afterwards. Um, judyreese.co.uk is my blog site. There's lots and lots of blog posts there about all subjects around remote meetings, remote conversations. And if you want to go deep into the subject, the Remote Meetings Masterclass with myself and Lizette Sutherland is two half days of deep exploration of how to get good at this stuff. Um, the code for a 20% discount is WIA. So we've talked about skill set, mindset and tool set. They all matter. Of the skills, start by developing your attention learn and practice like the pros and be like Tessie Reynolds is my recommendation. So before we dive into q and I'm going to drop you back into the same breakouts you were in just a moment ago and invite you to just pay attention to that difficult conversation that you would like to be different. How might what we've been talking about on this call be useful in that context. You're just going to have a couple of minutes to just see how you might apply what we've been covering. Okay, that's the rooms closed. So, um, I was just, we've, okay, I was just going to say, um, that's me, next chunk Q&A, but Philly has a question for you. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, because this is our first remote meeting and I, it meant the opportunity for people outside of London or the UK, within the UK or beyond to join. I was wondering if people wouldn't mind putting in the chat like where you were dialing in from tonight. Mm -hmm. okay. Or say it, maybe I could. <laughs> I was going with it. So we've got a few London. Have we got, yeah. oh, Danielle's in Dartmouth. Los, Los Angeles. Los Angeles, yay. Amsterdam. Oh, nice. I'm in South London.
lots of London. London. Lots of London. <laughs> South London is best London, Dylan. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think for, um, there's a couple of us based in Reading and you know, getting to London in the evening is doable, but it's it's way better doing this in the evening when you're shattered and don't want to get on the train, especially with uh, yeah, with everything going on with trains and viruses and everything. So it's been, it's been great to be part of it. Oh, thank you. So glad you could all come. We, we were actually discussing, like, should we run one in person and one remote a month? And then that would open up that we could have speakers friends that we've got in america who could do obviously can't fly over but yeah so we're, th we're thinking about doing that which i think seems like it might be successful <laughs> east london is not best sorry southeast yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay let's go with some questions okay. um so there are some questions in the chat we've probably got time for two or three maybe if we're quick yeah so there was questions coming through so um what are some ideas to build rapport online people you've never met face to face and that you can't have lunch with or have a coffee what, what's the equivalent of, of online for that um what's the problem with having lunch or a coffee with someone online you get crumbs in your microphone you get crumbs in your microphone but uh, <laughs> you can bring any time appropriate beverage to your conversation chips? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> chips <laughs> you can even get, you know, if, if you're if you're from an organization that has plenty of money, if you're working for a bank, you can even get um, pizzas delivered anywhere in the world to members of your remote team. Um, depending on the, where where everybody else in your meeting is, you might choose to have your time appropriate beverage delivered in a mug rather than a glass. <laughs> Okay, cool. But By the way, I'm reading out your questions. I'm not just asking questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you call someone out for not paying attention remotely? Interim, it's very clear if someone isn't paying attention and you can be confident in calling them out remotely. However, they could be taking notes or looking at slides, etc. Mm. I think mm. it, it's, it's a good question, an interesting question. And I think it, um, it provides a use case for a particular feedback model that I love called the clean feedback model, which invites you to separate out what you see or hear from the meaning that you make from that and the inference the, the, and, and the effect that that has on the situation. So evidence, inference, impact. So for example, you would say, I noticed that your eyes were, appeared to be looking well above the laptop screen and that there was a tapping noise. The meaning I make from that is that you're doing your email. The impact that has on me is I think I might as well not bother and I'll give up. But because you've stuck to the evidence, you've given them the opportunity to answer. Actually, no, I'm just making some notes. And you can say, would you mind sharing them? Then everybody can benefit and they can share the Google Google Docs link or whatever it might be. Now you don't, over time, of course, you'll get to know whether people actually are paying attention or not. And that's another question, but stick to the evidence of what you can see and hear and call it out that way. And there's not really much people can say about it. I was just wondering, is there a technique that we may be able to use to, where we don't have to say like all oh, kind of, is this something we're doing, but to keep everyone in the room? So if we see that people are maybe not paying attention, we could do something like say, during this meeting, I'm going to randomly do like a, a clap so that every time it will be like a different type of clap and see who can get it. So if you see people not paying attention, you might be like, you know, and then see if they can get it or I don't know, just so that it's not, you don't get any of that awkwardness. Mm -hmm. I haven't tried that one. Um, <laughs> as you've noticed so far on this, on this call, one of my tried and tested methods of keeping people engaged is to keep breaking them into small groups where, because in small groups, they can't get away with it. <laughs> Um, but yes, if you add more activities and physical activities, 
you can throw a virtual ball at people. Um, those kind of things can can keep the thing fun as well as keeping people engaged. So uh, definitely try the tap thing. I haven't tried it, but it, it sounds worth a go. Thank you. Uh, one more. Um, remote retrospectives, how to make it engaging? Um, use video. Um, don't overdo the tools, but one tool you might like to try is called Retrium, R-E-T-R-I-U-M. And that's specifically built for doing online retrospectives with agile teams. And he's got various tricks in it that make it easy to make them fun. Um, keep them moving is the other thing. Don't spend too much time laboring points. Let people say their thing, then get some voting going, and then, right, what should we do next? Try the fun techniques. Things like, you know, if we wanted to make, if we wanted to make next time as bad as it could possibly be, what would we do? Those kind of things that will get people talking. Um, another trick for remote meetings, which I've done some of the time on this call, not, not all the time, is it's because you haven't got eye contact, nor have you got body language in the same way as in the room, you need to call people's names when you want them to speak. If you just ask a general question into the room, you're quite likely to get silence. Whereas, you know, it, if you say set up a rule that if I call your name, it's OK to, to say pass, but I am going to call people's names and then call people's names. Say, what do you think, Jeanette? <laughs> what do you think, Jeanette? Um, I actually do that generally. I single out people and I notice that there is someone who really doesn't like me to do that. You know, there's always that one shy person in the room. Mm -hmm. Just not one to be the center of attention ever. Um, but they still need to give an opinion. So mm -hmm. yeah, definitely calling calling people will, will help. Thank you. And with that, I think we've reached the end of the time box for Q&A. We should be into our closing stages. Yeah. Um, so I just, I really want to thank everybody for being part of this. Um, we're still working out what our next meetup will be. We have been planning to do lightning talks again to give you all the community the chance to practice your public speaking, to hear new voices. We may still do that and do a remote version, which I've never done before, which would be interesting. Um, otherwise, we're because uh, we basically we tried to book our ven a venue and they went, oh, we're not booking any new events at the moment, which, yep, we understand that. So we'll, we'll be sending out communications, keep an eye on social media. If you want to contact us at all, and um, please give us feedback about tonight, what you thought we could improve upon, what you really liked. Um, and uh, you can contact us through our t Twitter, which is uh, womenldn, or go to our website, womeninagile.london. Um, and I also want to point out Bianca and Alex, who have been quiet tonight, but they're also the core organizers of Women in Agile London. They just made me do the talking because I had the biggest microphone. <laughs> um, but yeah, so really appreciate you all being here. And I feel like we want to add remote, regular remote, remote uh, meetups to our repertoire. So yeah. Thank you all and have an amazing night. And thank you so much, Judy, for again, being so adaptable. You're welcome. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been fun. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.